Uh, this morning's plan is for the placement of three ultra-short implants in the maxillary left for the second bicuspid, first and second molars. As you see in the area of the first and second molars, especially in the area of the first molar, the floor of the sinus is very close to the crest within two to three millimeters. For that area, we will perform a conservative and small internal sinus lift. The area uh, beyond that will also require an even smaller uh, sinus lift. We'll perform the two in tandem, and we will be able to place these three implants today. The recent extraction of the second bicuspid has left a, um, a slight um, area with the weakness of the top of the crest. The other extractions, uh, although they have been uh, missing for quite some teeth, these uh, for uh, quite some time, these two teeth have left a uh, kind of an imprint, a little divot right at the crest. And so for that, we cannot really uh, go beyond them by a uh, long distance, uh, a millimeter or two. But we have to lap a little bit over the, the crest for us to have access and visibility and also to be able to, cl to close the crest um, over these implants. Our incision will be curvilinear and will start from the uh, posterior. We're using a 15C blade. Open as wide as you can now, please. And we're going to hug the palatal slope of the crest and continue the incision. So right to the edge of the healing socket or healed socket of the extracted second bicuspid. We will then make a releasing incision, which we will extend slightly just past the mucogingival junction to allow us better mobilization of the entire flap. In order to lift this flap, the best way to do that is using a pivot, your thumb as a pivot, and your index as a protector so we don't over dissect. And we'll just go over that area and quickly elevate this. Because we are planning grafting in, in the form of uh, sinus lift, we will collect some of this liquid and use it to uh, moisten our graft particles. We intend to use, of course, the synthetic beta tricalcium phosphate synthograft, uh, the purest form of the beta tricalcium phosphate available to us. We will um, use a retraction suture. The retraction suture will allow us to work slightly more efficiently and certainly will protect this uh, flap from continue, continuing to be dissected every time we search for its end and, and uh, reflect it. So. Okay, so you see how this will help us see uh, quickly free up one hand or at least expedite the retraction. Okay, we're using a high speed with a sharp pilot drill we will create our pilot hole, or at least the beginning of it. We'll take a uh, paralleling pin. First, we'll look at it. We want to be sure that from an occlusal standpoint, this osteotomy is started in the right proximity. It seems to me that it, mi it might be slightly distal. What I would like to do with this one is to move the osteotomy slightly uh, mesially and slightly uh, palatally as I'm seeing that the edge of the, uh, let me see if I can show you that, the edge of our uh, buccal extent of the uh, bone is a little bit too close for comfort. And to do so, we just will tow it in a little bit and we'll go in. Roughly about six millimeters to seven millimeters or so. So as you can see now, this is a little bit more reasonable position. We will use that as a guide for the next pilot hole, which will be significantly shallower since we will be getting very close to the sinus.
So I want to drill just about three millimeters and we will stop. Because the floor of the sinus was, was at a slope, the uh, edge of this um, initial pilot hole might be encountering it already. Before we proceed, I will take a perio probe and make sure that I have not created an inadvertent perforation. And I don't have a perforation. And I know the osteotomy is at about four millimeters of depth in one end and three at the posterior end, which is a good thing. Again, checking the parallelism of the two. I think it's acceptable. And again, I'm gonna go about four millimeters. This one felt a little softer. And these are our three pilot holes. And as you see, these kind of gingerly penetrate the area. Again, we're going to a um, pretty shallow depth. It's a little bit, you know, very little bone, so I'm just going to go ahead and do two osteotomies without shaving the uh, tops or saving the shavings. And we will now complete the osteotomy for the bicuspid as I intend to place a four by five millimeter implant in there. And I want to place the implant at roughly two millimeters from the top of the crest. So we drill to seven millimeters, which is in the middle of the uh, first band. And my intent with this one is to go to five millimeter implant, five by five. Now, the hand reamers have the added advantage of being able to actually change the depth because of an offset at the very tip. The third osteotomy, which is for the second bowler, we have a lot of width. In this one, I will try to go to a six by five, and therefore, in this one case, we will show you the use of all five millimeter long implants available. I like to get to as wide an implant as possible. The length is not as much of an issue. The width is not uh, so much of an issue, but if you can get it wider, why not? And this is the five. I'll apply a little bit more pressure. I want to shave the, uh, the bottom a little bit more. You okay? Mm -hmm. What you want to be sure is not to miss any edge of the bone that may be pretty pretty thin so what I'm trying to do is shave mostly from the buccal distal and this corner right here and the the one important thing also about the hand reamers is that they are reaming so slowly so gently that <coughs> excuse me even if we were to remove all of the bone from underneath the, the sinus mucosa lining 
that lining will not likely be torn because it's just a, a significant width and um, a diameter that is not going to exert a pinpoint pressure that uh, has a higher likelihood of tearing the mucosa. Okay, and this is the sixth and final size. And now we will perform the sinus lift in the first and second molars. You want to make sure you still have a floor, and I do. And in the second molar, we also do. And it's a, it's a bony floor. The reason for having this kind of flare at the top is because I can enter the osteotomy, okay, and then angle it. I know that the mesial part of the osteotomy has to be thicker, so I will hit it harder. Okay, a little bit of tapping. Okay, stop the suction. I do. A little bit of tapping. You okay? Ooh. Take a break. No, as okay as can be expected, right? What also happens is the mesial, excuse me, the uh, buccal and palatal slopes can get involved because the ridge is not so wide. So you're not just fracturing a piece of floor, you may be compressing the bone first. So you give it a moment to sort of uh, rest, and then we come back for it in just a minute. So what we have is a, a tighter um, floor now. What's happened is it's kind of compressed. So what we can do is shave it down a little bit and then come back to this. What this is going to do is, uh, because of the offset at the very uh, top of the uh, reamers, it will take some of that bone that has been just compacted in the floor and uh, shave it up. As you can see, this is the same size that we had. The osteotomy is still five millimeters wide, but yet we're getting some bone. This is all from the floor and the slope leading to the floor. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think now it's starting to sort of yield a little bit. And continue. Okay. Okay, a little bit of tapping again. Here we go. You can hear the noise now, the sound is a lot softer, it's no longer resonant. That means we just fractured that floor. Retract a little bit more, Janet, so they see how far we've gone. I want to mobilize it by about, <clears throat> <coughs> excuse me, about four millimeters, which means I have to reach the top of the first mark. And that's why I'm still tapping while I know it's fractured. But that allows me to make sure that all of the sides of that osteotomy are freed up. And here we are, done. Okay, so we take it out, we switch to the wider osteotome, which is the six millimeter goes there. Now what'll happen is the back slope of this one is going to be tighter. But I think all in all, this will give a little bit faster. Okay, he needs a break. Sorry about that, you all right? The back slope again needs to be uh, thinned out. I still feel a bony floor, of course. I'm going to get those out because what the happens, these will become backed against the floor and start dampening the, uh, the force. Okay. There we go. I just saw it just move right now. And again, I want to move it to just above this top line. That means it's about four millimeters. It's mobilized. Now we will take it out. Okay, mallet, please. You want to seat it fully. Okay, you could seat it either using, this is called the inserter retriever. You can insert and retrieve with it. I have the rongeur. Oh, actually, I got it. Never mind. Yeah. To save the autogenous bone off to one side. I don't want to mix it in with the synthograft. Coagulum that we had saved from before, as you see, we will 
exude it all. Mm -hmm. We will then use a, um, a bone grafting syringe and we go in very gingerly, very slowly and, and again we, we um, inject the graft so ever so deliberately, ever so gently because the idea is to sort of fill the osteotomy and allow this to sneak in and start mobilizing the floor of the sinus. We want to make sure that uh, the uh, graft has gone in the floor. We will use a smaller expander. This is 4.5 and we start tapping it, okay? Uh, we probably will be secure without having to resort to a, uh, to a sinus uh, lift abutment, but we will see. And I can gauge that with the amount of resistance I'm getting to the tapping. That's pretty, pretty tight. But if you feel, if you, feel uh, you know, kind of nervous about putting it without some kind of uh, safety net, then you will put the... Uh, sinus lift abutment open wider please and the nice thing about these very short implants is that you can uh, adjust a little bit of that angulation before you close it let me see well, it's a little bit uh, shallow still I will push it down some more I do like to place the implants at roughly two millimeters below the crest this allows for a better circulatory access to get the bone to heal over the shoulder. Let alone, it makes the aesthetics a lot easier to achieve. Okay, again, the same thing. You're going to gingerly and very gently and slowly uh, inject the bone graft. And this is a bigger osteotomy. It will require a lot more graft. So, and you see there's kind of a little bit of a pumping action. It's just sort of I exert... Uh, um, inject a little bit of uh, the bone and then pack it a little bit and so on. All right, now again we will pack the uh, the bone and start lifting the sinus uh, floor and this is a side expander and we will tap it in. And now I know that the bone has gotten in there open wider okay okay you can twist it a little bit that allows some of the particles to escape go ahead suction it's okay yeah, no. yeah good step out now and again we seat it okay I'm happy with that seating there so we will double check the angulation before we seal them and that is by using these guide pins which are designed to give us uh, access and indication as to where the uh, implant is upon uncovering but we use them now because this is the last chance I will get to control these implants before I turn them over to uh, you know after they heal so as you see um, the uh, second molar you keep retracting please second molar implant will take the cell there it's slightly angled but that's okay we can fix it have the suction. Mm -hmm. I can change the angulation ever so slightly, and that's easy in soft bone. And in this case, it's this is the softest of bone. And same here. So I will estimate the depth about two millimeters from the top of the implant. If you look closely, there is a little bit of a of a ridge, a little bit of a mark. That's made by the implant having been with this, uh, packaged with this healing plug. So it makes a little mark, enough for me to know how high the implant is, and I cut about two millimeters above that. Then to seat it in place, there is a, a little, a bit of a, a hole right inside the, the center of this uh, healing plug. We'll introduce a perioprobe. Okay, that's it. First with the first molar. Open wider, please. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. Now both of these appear a little bit longer than I want them to be. So you can adjust them intraorally using the cutter. And this one. Like this. Now we just will pack the autogenous bone. Since we've used all of the, practically all of the graft, we'll pack that over the implants. So as you see, now we have this really biologically active bone over the shoulder that's going to create this favorable environment for the shoulder to receive new bone. First, we will release the retraction suture. Okay. Did you feel this? Mm -mm. No, good. Okay. And then we'll cut the short end. Okay. Always try to close these releasing incisions so they don't have a, a wide open appearance that will create an unsightly scar. Although this is at the far end of the aesthetic zone, And we'll put one just in the center. We place three implants that are all five millimeters in length. We place two of them with internal lifts. We placed one obviously without. But as you see, the three implants are exactly where we want them. And you see that this is a pretty significant uh, sinus lift. Now, um, the, uh, the sinus lift allowed us to go. If you, go, if you look strictly between the two implants, uh, you will um, see that the, the sinus floor is actually right, right at the first uh, fin uh, of both implants. The mesial and distal side of, the, of these implants are in native bone uh, up to the uh, fourth or fifth fin. And I'll turn it over now to Dr. Ordaneta. Um, <coughs> hello, I'm uh, Rainier Ordaneta. I'm a prostodontist. We're going to uh, begin by showing the radiograph. We uncover this uh, implant, and the day of uncovering, I placed a 5 millimeter wide by 10 millimeter um, long non shoulder abutment. Then I temporized it with a composite directly built up on top of the uh, uh, abutment. We're going to remove the abutment and we're going to then insert the um, crown. So this is an integrated abutment crown ready to be inserted. As you can see, it has uh, the abutment is, or the crown material is baked directly on top of the abutment so there is no need for screws or cement. We're going to begin first by removing the temporary restoration. So you can grab it with a crown removal forceps. This one with the flat surfaces I really like. And then just grab the crown and pull. Sometimes the abutment comes out with the crown, sometimes it doesn't. But I'm glad in this case it didn't because I'm going to then show you how to remove an abutment. So you grab both sides and at this point in time you can tap onto the instrument with a um, hammer. As I'm going to be showing it to you. Just tap right here. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Alternatively, you just rotate on the abutment and you pull. Okay, you don't want to torque. Okay, but you just want to rotate slightly and pull. We begin uh, cleaning the uh, post with alcohol. And we're going to go to the mouth and we're going to then clean the well. This is not absolutely necessary in a posterior area. We mainly do it in the interiors to obtain the best um, adaptation of the metals of the abutment in the well. But we're going to do it here just to show you this. Um, three millimeter 
uh, cotton swab has the exact same size as the implant well, so it cleans out perfectly down there. We're going to remove that and we're going to insert the crown. One, two, three. And go with the crown and the abut. So we press it, okay, and we rotate. And then we're going to check interproximal contact. The distal one it's tight whereas the missile one it's open so I am going to then rotate the crown okay and this you can do manually or you can just use the same instrument now I have a missile contact as well as a distal contact okay they seem to be pretty good I like to show you anyway the way you would um, adjust interproximal contacts. Let's say this distal contact was too tight. The way you're going to do it is, or the way my preference is, you grab the crown, remove it, then you're going to place a um, articulating paper in between the surface and you're going to slide the crown down, right? Remove the articulating paper and that will leave a mark that then you can adjust with a silicon wheel Okay, with a silicone wheel you can adjust it. Okay, and then you can insert it. I'm going to clean again the crown with alcohol, remove all the excess of the powder, and then I am going to insert it again in the mouth. That is, if the contact is not too, too tight and the crown is going down, again, I have a missile and I have a distal interproximal contact. The distal seems a little tight, but not too bad. Now I'm going to tap lightly on the crown to sit the crown down. For this, you have different ways. Dr. Morgan's preferred way is you uh, ask the patient to bite down into, bite down please, into the crown with a cotton uh, swab open and that sits the restoration, okay? I prefer giving a little bit of taps because I love a hammer. So I'm just gonna tap on this, a couple of this in each cusp. That was the facial cusp, this is the lingual cusp, all right? Then I'm gonna check interproximal contacts one more time. The distal remains a little tight. I have a perfect mesial contact. So. The next way you can adjust interproximal contacts is with the use of a diamond strip. Very nice. This is, I like the ones that are yellow uh, diamond strips. They're really, they're really fine diamond strips. Okay. And I'm going to place it in the distal area, get it in, and then I'm going to move it. Okay. Around the interproximal contact. This particular, um, uh, yellow one is so thin that you can actually use it many many times and it doesn't really uh, remove the interproximal contact it just makes it perfect okay so you can you have to make sure you protect the patient's lips because this diamond strip loves to cut lips and I've done it many times okay a little bit more okay and then we're going to check interproximal contact one more time it remains a little tight, so I'm going to go a little bit more with that. And as you can see, it's, it's very easy. You can do it as many times as needed until you get the perfect interproximal contact. Okay, check one more time. Perfect. I like that contact. Now we're going to tap a little bit more just to make sure, just in case the interproximal contacts being tight didn't allow the crown to go down all the way down, I'm just going to tap one final time. And now I'm going to check occlusion. Okay. By down, open, close, open. By down, and you can ask the patient, does it feel a little high? Is it comfortable? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. We have contact there on all the adjacent teeth as well as in the crown. I would prefer the contact in the crown to be just 
slightly little lower so I'm and I do not like this uh, sliding uh, contact in the lingual cusp so I'm going to adjust that since this is a restoration that is polyceramic and not porcelain it is very easy to adjust so we go adjust that sliding contact in the lingual and lighten a little bit that distal marginal ridge contact then we're going to check occlusion one more time by down open that's perfect. Now, by down, now you're going to grind left, right, front, back. Open. Just want to see if the tooth is guiding. It's guiding slightly towards the distal facial. So I am going to grind it a little bit there because I don't want to guide in contacts. I don't think it will create many problems. It's obvious that this tooth is guiding with the adjacent ones, but. So it's obviously group function, but in any case, I want to just adjust it there, open a little wider. Now I'm going to polish again with, uh, finish with a um, wheel, polishing wheel. It's a really highly polishable composite resin, or it has 10% of composite. It's a polyceramic with a highly polishable surface. As you can see, you achieve polishing very, very nicely. Even though it's definitively seated, you could remove this crown. And I'm just going to illustrate for you what you would do in that case. You're going to use a uh, the same crown removal forceps, grab the crown, and then you can tap on it with a hammer, or you can rotate a little bit and pull at the same time, and then you'll be able to remove it. That's one of the most um, one of my most favorite features of this is the ability to be able to remove the crown if I need to in the future for adding contacts because it broke or whatever necessary adjustment. Okay, as you can see, there isn't any metal showing, but if there was any metal showing in the abutment, I could remove the crown, send it back to the lab, or to add a little bit more composite in that metal area and have it repaired so there's no need for any uh, problems with that. All right, so this is all set. We're going to take a radiograph. I, I know that the um, crown is inserted all the way down because there is two threads of the implant uh, left, you know, two threads of space left at the end of the well, it tells me that uh, you know within a, a framework the, uh, of you know it's this is definitely seated down. Um, basically, the best uh, way to treat a perforation is not to have one in the first place. So measure twice or three or four times, do whatever it takes to avoid that. If you have a perforation, the second uh, thing you have to do is know that you have a perforation. Um, so before you proceed, you're going to look at all the signs of perforation, excessive bleeding, bubbling from, uh, from there. If you have a big tear, your, your membrane, you can feel that there is no resistance as you introduce your uh, graft. If your graft just flies in and it just keeps going and it's not giving you any resistance, that's a dead giveaway that you have a tear. And so once you've recognized that, what you need to do is take out anything that you have in the socket, graft and otherwise, cut a, a resorbable, either containment membrane, such as a collagen tape, or a uh, resorbable um, you know, collagen membrane, a barrier membrane, cut it three to four fold the size of your osteotomy, moisten it so it's very pliable, introduce it in the osteotomy, then introduce your graft in it, then introduce your implant in the graft. So it's sort of a layered approach. You want to have it big enough that it still is touching the side of the osteotomy, and you put it in and you secure an implant and your membrane together that way, okay? Um, the, the implant doesn't have threads. These are not um, spiral threads. So screwing it in there allows you to sort of mobilize it a little bit, but it's not meant to be seated by twisting in. It is meant to be pressed in, pressed either gently or with a little bit of tapping. Now the question really is why did I tap and not just push it in? Well, tapping with a very light um, 
a mallet, like the surgical mallet that we're using, is a lot gentler than putting your upper body weight behind it, which can force it in very abruptly and very forcefully, and you end up with the implant in the sinus. So when in doubt, just use a very light tapping with a very light mallet with a very sort of deliberate uh, uh, progression, okay? But the implant is not a screw implant. Those that you see are plateaus that are parallel. They are meant to go in by friction, not by screwing in. I actually over trim it on purpose most of the time. Uh, I would much rather have the black plug be sort of just slightly within the confines of the crest of the bone. It is then less likely to allow for permucosal um, uh, loading of the implant or <clears throat> in case of thin mucosa to cause it to wear through uh, too early in, in an in, you know, sort of an inopportune spot that would deprive the implant from attached gingiva as we uncover it. So no, I, I, um, if I were using the, um, the black plug, I want it to be spot on or shorter than the crest of the bone. <clears throat> now over trimming it so much that you know, the, the, it's lost inside the well, um, I mean, you know, that's, that's not going to help you because it'll make, it, make uncovering that implant extremely risky to the implant and to the, uh, uh, you know, to the patient in particular. So we ask you to keep it above the implant uh, and preferably right at or ever so slightly below the bone. Crown to root ratio is not a risk factor uh, for crestal bone loss or a risk factor for um, uh, implant or crown failure. We demonstrated this in a manuscript that we published last month in the International Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Implants where we demonstrated that uh, increased crown to implant ratios up to 4.95, that is almost five times the length of the implant within the bone, did not have a statistically significant effect on crown um, implant failures, uh, crown failures, or in the um, or in crestal bone loss. What we have actually learned with our own experience is that um, bone likes to be loaded. Okay, so one of the reasons we believe strongly nowadays that we lose bone around implants is because we have been using implants that are too long and implants that are splinted. So the bone simply is, uh, dies away or, or is resorbed uh, as a result of um, disuse atrophy. Um, bone likes to be loaded, so a short implant uh, a per, per thread will distribute much more forces to the bone than a longer implant. Thus, the effects that you're going to see or for a longer uh, crown to implant ratio in or those biological responses like crestal bone response is, um, are, are beneficial. I can tell you from my own research that if a bicon implant is five millimeters wide, if it is 11 millimeters long, it's significantly more likely to lose bone than if it is eight millimeters long. And we hypothesize in a manuscript that we have uh, right now under review that it is the length that for a five millimeter wide implant, 11 millimeters is simply too long. I um, basically just bonded a temporary crown to the adjacent teeth. Well, I had a uh, porcelain crown on one side and a tooth on the other. So using, uh, you know, silane couplers on one side and then just regular bonding procedures on the other, we just made a regular temporary. We try to avoid doing flippers. Uh, we try to avoid, I, I haven't found one patient that likes them. So if we can, we, in, only, in the only area we found limited uh, clinical success is when we have two adjacent porcelain crowns and it's a very tight occlusion, it just doesn't work. In those cases, it's better to treatment plan for a, for a flipper, for an interim removable partial denter. So, uh, well, thank you all for your attention and, and thank you uh, to all our colleagues who've been patiently with us online and to our friends and colleagues in Tver.